Hello, everyone. Welcome to our third step conversation series. We broadcast today live from TV Nantes in Nantes, France, from Audencia Business School. My name is Miruna Radu Lefebvre. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship at Audencia Business School, and I will be your host today, as well as to the next two step conversation series taking place throughout this academic year. Today, our conversation is about growth in family business succession and beyond. And in terms of timing, we'll start with a brief presentation based on recent research of, on growth conducted by our colleagues, Natalia Vercinina and Vincent Lefebvre. So let me please introduce you first to Natalia. Natalia Vercinina, she's a professor of entrepreneurship at Odensea Business School, and she's an associate editor in several journals, Journal of Business Research, International Journal of Entrepreneurial Behavior and Research, and Entrepreneurship and Regional Development. Hello, Natalia. I'm delighted to have you with us today. Thank you, Miruna, for inviting me. And now let's turn to Vincent Lefebvre. Vincent, he is a professor of entrepreneurship and head of the department Entrepreneurship, Innovation and Strategy at Audencia Business School. He is also an associate editor at the Revue de l'Entrepreneuriat, as well as a social media editor at Entrepreneurship and Regional Development. Hello, Vincent. Welcome. Thanks for the invitation. So today we will spend one hour discussing about growth in family business succession and beyond. And we will start with a 20 minute presentation on growth, recent findings and insights provided by Natalia and Vincent. Then we will open up a discussion, another 20 minutes discussion with you watching us from home on our YouTube channel, as well as here in the studio together with our professor Dimo Dimov, um, Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Bath University in the UK and founding editor-in-chief of the Journal of Business Venturing Insights, who will join us later. And then we will end up our session with an overview of current publication opportunities in entrepreneurship and family business. I hope you'll have a great time with us. And please don't hesitate to share your questions and comments on our YouTube channel online. Let me first start before going into more details on growth and research with a natural com question coming up into my mind when we discuss about growth. What is actually growth? How can we characterize this notion? And I know that you, Natalia, you teach um, a growth class to our MBA students at Odensea Business School and that you are using a classical definition of growth, that of Penrose. Can you please help us understand what is growth? Sure. I think uh, the theory of the growth of the firm is one of the fundamental texts that one should go to when examining growth. And uh, Penrose explains quite explicitly that there are two particular ways in which we observe growth. One is in terms of uh, output. So output through export, through sales, something that grows in terms of numbers. But the second way and kind of second perspective on growth, which uh, Penrose, Edith Penrose offers to us, is uh, in the quality and in increases in quality, possibly the result of the natural biological processes, possibly the result of the process of development within the firm. And uh, what this does is it helps us to understand how through series of activities, internal changes, transformations within the firm, uh, there are changes that are associated with size, but also changes of the growing object. And I think this perspective is very useful when discussing family businesses because growth within family businesses is associated in several transformations. Many thanks, Natalia. I wonder if you, Vincent, you see, you perceive growth in similar ways. I perceive growth as a, an extraordinary phenomenon, a, a process by which uh, companies, families and, uh, and entrepreneurs themselves create something new and, and bring uh, something which is actually what you mentioned with growing. Something is growing. What is growing? I'm observing this phenomenon for over 20 years, learning about it, and 
there is still things to discover, to new things to have insights about, and it's still knowledge, lots of knowledge to create based on this. So we're going to share lots of elements today, but there is so much more to, to discover on this particular topic. Mm -hmm. So as far from, from the definition, we already see that actually when we speak about growth as a phenomenon, there, there, are, there is a discussion concerning the antecedents, but also the outcomes, and then these processes, growth as a process. So mm -hmm. opening the black box, as, as Dimo Dimov uh, named it, labeled it a uh, few, few, several years ago. So to start, maybe we should just summarize, try to summarize. I know, Natalia, that I'm asking you a lot. <laughs> try to summarize um, research conducted over decades in entrepreneurship. But what do we know about growth in a nutshell? Thank you. Big task, but I will do my best to try and do a gist through, sort of go through, go through what, what we know. And I think one of the key fundamental principles comes from uh, the ideas that were originally discussed by Per Davidson, uh, Frederick Delma and Johan Wicklund in, in a way that uh, uh, what firms say about growth really matters. Growth is not homogeneous. We know that all, all firms grow at different points in time. They struggle with consistent behavior, sustaining growth over time. We also know that growth is not random. And finally, it's not deterministic either. You cannot assume that certain uh, acts lead to certain uh, outcomes or increase in outcomes. And growth is not necessarily something that we perceive as a good indicator for firm performance. So this is kind of the initial slant at uh, where we are. But. Uh, it may, you know, we, we might argue that it's not an exceptional or rare phenomenon then. It's something that happens to all the firms. Well, in fact, not all firms grow. Not all young firms grow. Not all small firms grow. Not all independent firms grow. Uh, but some of them will grow. Mm -hmm. And some of them should grow because they have an incredible product or process. And some of them even really want to grow. And they talk about this. But very few firms pursue growth over extended periods of time. Okay, so overall we may say that although growth is somehow involved or might be involved for with every company, growth per se still uh, remains rather an exceptional or rare phenomenon for many companies. Possibly, <laughs> possibly. But what my kind of uh, dive into the literature indicates that, in fact, growth is a double-edged sword. In fact, what we see is that a lot of firms uh, indicate they would like to grow. And on the slide, you will see a very interesting study um, uh, which, which highlighted uh, a processual view of growth where um, the firms, I think there's over 36,000 different firms in the sample have been recorded over the period of four different uh, phases in their development and only 3% of the 100% sample mm -hmm. indicated growth consistently over the four period of points. Mm -hmm. Growth appears, appears sporadically and the majority of firms, and if, if you look at the slide at the bottom mm -hmm. uh, of the highlighted uh, slide, you'll see over 26,000 firms in the sample do not choose to pursue growth across four periods. Mm -hmm. What does that tell us about our insights about growth? Not many firms pursue it, and it's, it is an exception, in fact. Okay, very interesting. And also, I, I like very much this, this idea, this metaphor, actually, that you are using uh, to, to speak about growth, and which goes somehow against the common sense uh, perception that growth is always good. Uh, for, for companies, always good, of course, for regions and for the economy in general. And you speak about growth by, by, uh, by labeling it a double-edged sword. What does it mean exactly? Well, it basically means that it's, it has both the positive and negative effects and we can't disentangle one from the other. Uh, we know that most of the firms would like to grow, but when they do, and when it happens, when growth happens, one is it, it, it's uh, it's possibly seen by the market, by the investors as an interesting indicator of entrepreneurial venture potential. Yet it may 
push the firm into growth that they didn't want to pursue and particularly if they uh, sometimes uh, identify an interesting lucrative niche in the market or a new product opportunity they're pushed by into growth by their suppliers for which they're not ready mm -hmm. and that that makes it quite challenging to therefore open up and, and decipher yeah. so and how about family firms? Um, you know, um, this, this idea came into my mind um, together with, you know, um, examining the results of the National Observatory of Family Entrepreneurship that we launched here at Odansia, the Chair of Family Entrepreneurship and Society. And one of the findings which actually struck me was the perception of the French population that family firms do not grow or that they grow less <laughs> than non-family firms. And I wondered, do family firms really grow or less? Do they grow, they grow less than non-family firms? What are your perceptions and what, what does the lit literature uh, tell us in family business about this phenomenon? I think uh, this is a very important question, particularly for this uh, program, because there is a really popular perception. So it's not just in France, but it's in a lot of countries around the world. There is an, uh, an understanding that family firms do not pursue growth. And the literature echoes this in, uh, for instance, explaining uh, the inaction of firms. Um, there is a famous quote, which you'll see on the slide, uh, which talks about the fact that family businesses fail because they allow themselves to be destroyed by inaction, by not actually pursuing, by not making the right decisions at the right time, uh, so that it jeopardizes the vitality of the business and uh, it moving forward because the things around them are changing. Yeah, Where, yet they tend to stick to what they know best. Mm -hmm. And this is in the words of a very famous consultant then who became an academic, uh, Leon Danko. And I think these words, surprisingly, remain very relevant to the family firms nowadays in this contemporary world. Mm -hmm. But beyond inaction, when we think about the specificities of mm. family firms, um, we can also imagine that they face unique challenges, <laughs> which come actually from, from their very specificities. Am I right? Uh, sure, because the challenges of growth are multiple. You know, we, we shouldn't forget, first of all, that there is a natural, uh, you know, sort of business cycle and things are changing. Uh, we have... Um, kind of this realization that family firms sometimes stick to a particular paradigm uh, because it worked before. Yeah. But it doesn't mean it's going to work in the future. We also assume that if, um, you know, you become a successful entrepreneurial firm, growth will happen on its own. Uh, we are learning about our vital skills in relation to other firms. We are absorbing information. We're constantly kind of moving beyond what, what's, what's happening in, in the business. The industry is pushing us to perform better. Uh, we know that sometimes good business growth, the one that makes sense in terms of numbers and the ability of the firm to, to, to cope with their ambition, doesn't necessarily mean that the firm will be satisfied with where they are and they may push themselves forward. Um, and finally, we might also assume because family firms are ubiquitous in terms of the stakeholders, that, 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 that represent the most important decision makers in the firm. We don't know whether the diversity of the goals might sometimes detract them from the possibilities that lie ahead if they were to pursue growth. Mm -hmm. Many thanks, uh, Natalia. And, and indeed, what you're telling us suggests that family firms do grow in mm -hmm. certain circumstances. <laughs> and we know based on the family business literature, that there are several uh, particular measures through which we might assess uh, growth. And the most, the two measures most used in the, in the literature are sales growth and uh, employment growth. And what is interesting to, to notice as a characteristic of family firms is that many of them seem to prioritize employment growth instead of sales growth. Why? Because employment growth relates to reputational issues and has an impact on their community. And we know how important these issues are for family firms. 
And there are several antecedents and mechanisms which have been identified in the family business literature in connection to growth. And these are mainly innovation, internationalization, and succession. And we will start with the first two of them, mm -hmm. and I turn to you, Natalia. So in relation to innovation and internationalization, what do we know uh, in a nutshell between this uh, variable and growth? So innovation, obviously, is a really big area of research which is connected to growth, and particularly in the context of uh, family firms. We know that all firms in general operate at uh, resource constraint situation, a context. Uh, but what we have identified through some empirical investigations is that innovation is also recognized as, a, as an essential firm-specific determinant uh, which is responsible for enhancing firm growth particularly in family businesses. We also know a lot about innovation. We have so many different authors that work in this, in this area. Uh, we know that innovation is a set of uh, activities through which a firm is able to conceive, design, manufacture, and introduce new products, new services, new processes. But this happens in different ways in family businesses. Innovation through tr tradition, so the coin originally defined by Alfredo Di Masis and uh, many other scholars have picked it up. Uh, they show cases, possibly um, uh, a little bit of a hesitation in relation to growth uh, because innovation through tradition means relying on existing processes and not changing, not necessarily amending things, but acting and building on this specific competitive advantage advantage. We also know that family firms are very conservative when it comes to innovation, which restricts their possibilities for growth. And finally, they're also risk averse when it, when it comes to in investing into research and development, which means that they sometimes um, vote themselves out of the possibilities of that the growth can bring. Mm -hmm. When it comes to internationalization, I think it's also important to note that internationalization is a perfect example of a quiet storm that can be brought into a family business because family business feels very comfortable in the uh, extant market and the market in which they have the home base. Uh, however, the moment they're outside of their comfort zone, things become more difficult. And that means you need to forge certain alliances. It, it requires major investments into building networks, into understanding the communities, understanding the customer behavior. And at times that creates the double-edged sword that we earlier talked about. Yeah, very, very interesting. And how about succession, uh, Vincent? How it might affect growth in, in family business? Yeah, <clears throat> before describing the succession mm -hmm. process, I would like to add a few com elements about growth itself because um, it's, it's a question of trajectory and succession, in my view, is part of the trajectory of family firms, it's like a, a momentum during which things are happening. And there is a very interesting research uh, from colleagues in Nancy, it's La Biga Dembedu and uh, his colleague Gai, that they identified and they work on the trajectory of, it's, it's for new ventures, but it's, it's really interesting to have this uh, perspective of thinking about states and, and, and not st only stages in in a, in a growing up process, and having this in mind that there is they, they try to identify. We talked about variables. We are uh, trying to catch employment uh, or uh, revenues or all, all these kinds of. There are hundreds of possibilities. We can look at lots of indicators about growth, but which one are the most representative of the phenomenon of growth at the certain moment? This is still an a question we we kind of ask ourselves. It means that in, in their studies they identified that they work with all the variables, possible variables, and trying to identify with big numbers of companies the the most important variables, those who make the difference between a state and another state. And they're not talking about stages because they assume that when you have a stage perspective, mm -hmm. it's like when you reach a stage, you're not going back. Yeah. But if you're mm -hmm. talking about a state, it means that you can reach a state mm -hmm. and go back to another state mm -hmm. and move to one to another state, which is quite interesting to imagine that it's it's the, the phenomenon, it's much more complicated that 
having stage numbers reaching a, a certain level and moving to the next generation and passing the button and say, okay, you we reach this stage, you can move to the next one. And you, your job is moving to the next one. And this is uh, what happened in the succession process. We used to have the, like, you have a company at a certain stage, move it to the next one. Mm -hmm. But it's a certain state. Yeah. And, and, and the indicators you are going to move or use as a successor can change a bit. But what we know about d during the succession process and the growth, there are few elements we, we have about the financial performance. We know that passing the button offers an opportunity for a better performance as a, as a financial perspective. Mm. It offers also uh, the capacity to uh, the equity will change a bit and we have kind of, and this is one of the element of the state, which is like having your resources. It means that the resources, the equity will change and which is quite interesting to take it into account. But the financial performance globally by the, uh, moving to the next generation offer better results. But it, all those elements we must take and always remember that we have this quantitative information, but in a certain business, it will happen deeper. It may happen differently. So generalizing is like big numbers of generalization. But in some cases, we know that this kind of things, it's, can, it's not mechanical. Mm -hmm. The process itself mm -hmm. may change from a, a company to another. In the family members, uh, when they are, you, you, are, you are going to have uh, family members as CEO of a company because we are sometimes talking about entrepreneurs, founders, CEO, it may change. And the vocabulary is quite interesting because we are using sometimes uh, entrepreneur instead of CEO and founders. And, and it's really interesting. But when we are talking about uh, different generation, we used to have CEO passing the baton to another one. It's a family member. It's not a family member. It's, in the case, it's, it's not a family member. We, we observe that there is a period of time during which the, the, there is a performance decreasing. But it's, as I mentioned it before, it's generalization about, in certain cases, Passing to a CEO, which is uh, not a member of a family business, can be a real opportunity for the for the the business itself and keeping it as a family business. But it's uh, in the most cases when the family business uh, the fa the CEO is a member of the family business, it offers better performance. And finally, it's uh, it's something which is quite interesting because we have this increasing number of members around the table. I mean, it's try to imagine. Take two seconds and try to imagine you have to organize a wedding dinner every year with all the consortium of cousins and you have to pick who is going to sit uh, at what place and it's difficult for one wedding dinner but imagine you have to do it every year and when you are the third generation and you have all the cousins, aunts and uncles and all the members of the family around the table it can become a bit difficult. It's difficult when you have to do it once, but imagine you have to reproduce it every year and try to find. And it's not only for good news. It's not only for <laughs> wedding party. It's also, it can be for also bad news about the family. So it makes it, uh, imagine that the growing, the, the, the family is also growing. Each succession is offering new members, new participants around the table. It's mm. difficult with only your family and imagine you have, it's more or less the same that organizing a wedding dinner every year <laughs> and sharing good and also bad news. So it's, uh, it becomes more and more difficult for, uh, for people to, to, do, uh, to do so. So this is probably uh, one of the really interesting dimension of, uh, of this, uh, this succession and growth. Which also suggests in, in a way that when we speak about growth in family firms, we, we, we have organizing processes which are somehow masked or at, at least, you know, silenced by current research, not only at the level of the business, but also at the level of the family. And so growing happens not only in the firm, in the family firm, but also in the family. And therefore, there are certainly um, things which might happen between the two processes. The two processes might be parallel, there might, might be tensions, there might be 
conflicts, <laughs> um, and and this is still something to be to be studied in for future research. Thank you very much, Vincent, for these interesting ideas and, and perspective on growth in family business, and they make me think actually about the complexities mm -hmm. and difficulties that family firms face along the road. There are certainly limits to growth, not only objectively because of the size and because of the resources available in the company and because of the shortage in some cases of managers able to combine these resources in imaginative uh, ways and to detect opportunities based on uh, the use of these resources, but also because of the tensions and paradoxes inherent to family firms, such as the paradox between growth and liquidity needs. And this paradox arises Exactly because of what you just said, Vincent, because of the fact that the family is also growing and then therefore more and more uh, all shareholders might ask for or expect for dividends. So which, of course, might constrain uh, the, the liquidities of the companies and might constrain its investment mm -hmm. uh, strategies and therefore limits any, any possibilities for growth. Well, I think that we dedicated um, much time to to this, you know, classical perspective of, of growth. And we looked at growth through the lens of the firm performance. However, while we do so, uh, and we talk, talk um, about antecedents and outcomes mm -hmm. of growth, somehow we forget to evoke the issue essential to us uh, the, um, of how growth happens you know and um, i know that yeah this this was labeled by by dimo dimov our our guest who will just show up in a few minutes uh, who frame it as the black box of growth how growth happens um, what do you think vincent about it i i know that you struggled with with this issue together with Natalia over the last Yeah, we, we, we struggled a little bit because we, we assumed that, we started the research assuming that we are, we don't know a lot about it. And it was like, and taking it was with uh, new venture owners and it, because it's, it's easier to analyze and there is less components in the context uh, to, to, to look at. But it's, um, it offered us uh, a, a new way of trying to share uh, narratives with entrepreneurs uh, and, and see what happens during several years following companies, following entrepreneurs and, and try to, to identify what they really do mm -hmm. and not what was the uh, outcomes uh, or, or what was their antecedent, what they, did they do, what their father and mother <laughs> did, but uh, really focus on what they do in their everyday uh, as an entrepreneur. And it was uh, picking out activities, looking at what they used to do at, uh, and, and trying to reorganize it uh, and, and try to see patterns behind. And it was uh, really interesting because it was like we had in mind that when the business will, will be launched, that usual business activities mm. will be, uh, they will become more CEO and less entrepreneur and, and, and that usual business activities will be the main activities. But definitely during the first three, four, five years, it was not the case. Mm. Uh, we, we, we identify several bundle of activities like, mm. uh, 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 it, like the first one, which was like becoming a, a, an actor becoming someone in the industry. It means that you are a nobody, you are starting a business, maybe you have the experience before, but sometimes not, and you are nobody. Mm -hmm. And and you must become someone and it dedicates time to exist as an entrepreneur, as a CEO in your industry. It was also things, activities dealing with lots of networking activities and social capital building and reframing, which was a, a, a really part of the day life of the entrepreneurs also learning learning which is like crucial part of the process and it's exactly the same in the succession process mm -hmm. you have to learn uh, and and you have to learn from the very first day you you are taking over 
from the day you are going to passing the baton you are going to learn at every uh, at every moment and it's not all it's not part i really identify as usual business activities and and also finally organizing structuring which is like things like processing mm. learning more looking after the process of the of the company and and being sure that you are using the right resources at the right place with the right people doing the right things it's mean like it's something we can find out also in nicole Coviello's um, paper on, on, on scale-ups which are like process people and um, and places which are like part of the uh, of the growing uh, process activities so which also suggests that somehow when we open the black box of growth we also we should ask new questions such as uh, two of the questions that you suggested before when we prepared this TV show. The first one was growing for whom and the second one growing for what? What do you mean by these questions, Vincent, in a, in a succession? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that the growing for whom, I, I realized when I was training uh, successors that it was really interesting because we uh, we used to start like what are you going to do with the business when you're and it and it's it's it sometimes and it was like a very impressive moment for me it was like uh, do, am i obliged to imagine the future of a business with high gross expectation or can i just and was like why are you asking me if you are authorized to think about having a specific kind of growth for what do you mean? I was like, oh, because everybody is expecting from me to have a high gross expectation for the succession process and right after to develop it internationally. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> is, is it, is, are you going to do it for the other one? Or is, who is going to create the plan? Who is expecting gross? But was it really explicit from your from the part of the others? It was like family members. Do family members mention it officially? Ask you, do are we going to have this uh, this kind of growth? I think it's quite interesting what you're saying because literature on succession clearly defines that family members expect that the new CEO, the incumbent, is going to capitalize on what family has built mm. and make it better, bigger, mm. make them wealthier mm. and make the business more successful. So there is this implicit expectation mm. that the person that's taking over the business is going to, to grow the business. Mm. So exactly, which introduces this, we may, we, we may call it a social psychological perspective on growth. We, we are here at the intersection of different expectations, self-expectations. I want to impress myself. I want to convince myself of my, of my own self-worth and legitimacy in the field, in the industry. But at the same time, I want to impress and to gain legitimacy, to impress others and to gain legitimacy in the eyes of the family, of the predecessor and of the industry in general. So for sure, expectations and growth expectations is an issue which we should take into account when studying succession. And the second one, which the second question you, which you mentioned, Vincent, is growing for what? Is it a growth, a goal or a means to achieve something? Yeah, it's it's really related to the first mention of mm. growing for womb because we, we have this gap between self perception perception and the implicit of the family but it's and, and the, it would mean that we're not talking about are we going to grow yes no is it part of the plan yes no but it's 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 for what i mean it's it, sh it should be asked also but it's it usually it's not i mean ask is uh, for what people will say as you mentioned uh, natalia uh, yeah to increase the revenues of the companies to uh, increase the dividends i mean, <laughs> yes, sure, I mean sure, it's, exactly. it's, uh, there are yeah, more and more people we will we have to share with more and more people yes. increasing dividends is one of the objective being able at the minimum to maintain it okay so maintaining it but maintaining it means growing at the same time because maintaining it is um, with more people means growing the number of uh, the capacity to give dividends. Mm -hmm. So is it only for dividends? Is it for other reasons? Is there, uh, is there as you mentioned, uh, Natalia, at the beginning, is there the, the product is amazing and can get up a really big impact. So we all want, really want to, to sell it to more and more people and being able to, to increase the number of product sales or increase the number of employees we may have. Uh, 
to be able to become an actor at a local level or international level or not? We, there is lots of, but for what? It means it, what is the, the new objective of, of the, the next generation, which is, it's yeah, rare yes. to mention it, ask, make it clear. It's super rare to make it clear, uh, to be explicit about what are our expectations yes. and who is asking for growth mm. as it is uh, yeah. not mentioned to have like this kind of what, why are we going to have this cross? Yes, yes. Many, many thanks uh, to both of you, Natalia and Vincent. We end our first uh, uh, part of the TV show here. We're now looking up to your questions. So please share with us on our, your questions on our YouTube channel. Stay with us online for the next minutes of discussion on growth in family business succession and beyond. Thank you. again. <laughs> welcome and welcome to Professor Dimo Dimov, Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the University of Bath in the UK and Founder Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Family, Journal of Business Venturing Insights. <laughs> Sorry, we spoke so much about family. Um, <laughs> hello Dimo, we're delighted to have you with us today. Thank you, Marina. Uh, great to be here. What are your first reactions to the discussion, to the presentation we had in the first part of the TV show? Uh, it's been Quite exciting, quite fascinating. There's obviously uh, gr growth is a, a huge, a very complex phenomenon, many different facets, uh, many different questions, and, and that's what's make it, made it so uh, rich. I thank you very much, Dimo. And I know, of course, uh, as well as our audience knows it very well, you've been involved for several decades in studying the entrepreneurial journey with different theoretical frameworks, different methodologies, very much interested in the issue of opportunity, uh, in practices, pragmatic theory, language. And I, we also know, of course, that you've published recently a beautiful paper on growth. And so, of course, we're excited to learn uh, a little bit more about, about this paper, taking a systemic perspective mm. on growth and using a very interesting and challenging methodology. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, this was uh, this was recent work uh, with, with a colleague, uh, Jin Feng Lu, um, and this is a, a computational simulation. This is a trying to understand the growth of a firm as a as a process that can be simulated uh, computation. This way, we can actually explore interactions, uh, the systemic nature of a firm in ways that are very difficult to observe uh, empirically, and we can also. Um, model and explore quite a lot of counterfactuals. So one of the things we observe and one of the challenges of trying to do empirical work and grow this is uh, we only observe the things uh, that have happened. And you can always wonder, well, well, a lot of other things could have happened, but they didn't, right? And so this, this counterfactual is very difficult to study, uh, study empirically, uh, but it's something that could be done with, with computational uh, theory. Um, and in fact, what, what, what the paper does uh, in a way is takes takes a firm, think of a firm, okay, the firm is not a thing, the firm is, a, is actually a complex system. It's a system of interacting, uh, interacting parts. And when we talk about growth, uh, we realize that growth is not something that just happens. Uh, with growth, we have to deploy uh, resources, they have to be converted into something, made into products, uh, and then actually sold. Uh, in the market and the resources come back and hopefully more resources come back than we started with. And if you have that loop working, then you have increase in resources. Uh, but you can also have where the loop works in the other way, where you actually receive less than you actually spend and you end up uh, running into, into the ground. Um, so we pick up on, on uh, started with, with Penrose, Natalia, and the definition, and Penrose has, talks about generating mechanism, talk about feedback processes in that description of the theory that she, that she presents. Uh, and there's a very interesting interplay there between resources and what she calls a productive opportunity set, which is this sense that these resources need to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. They need to be allocated towards the pursuit of what she calls these productive opportunities. And hopefully, uh, the firm ends up with more resources uh, than, than it starts. So we, we have this, this thing. We start with resources and you do two things as you try to grow, as you try to be entrepreneurial in, in the way we, we frame it. There's one loop that consumes resources and there's another loop that 
generates resources. And at the end, you observe the balance. What's the relative balance between the two? And uh, we can show computationally that in some cases, uh, things that don't go, they start out well and then run into the ground. The, the, this, is, this is the advantage. In other cases, uh, this is, the, this is uh, first better than, than worse, uh, in which case things don't start very well, but in the end, uh, they, they, can, they can take off. Yeah. And what is the role actually of the individual? in this feedback loop. So who decides actually? Who's the main uh, factor deciding or influencing the direction of the feedback mm. loop or the outcome of the feedback mm. loop? What, what can we do actually to, to secure a positive loop? Can we? Maybe not. Uh, well, I, I suppose that the, the short answer would be perhaps not, because not, not everything is, is – we, we do the things that are within our control, but at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it's, it's the market that yeah. decides mm -hmm. what works and what doesn't. So we have to recognize that there's always something beyond our control. Mm -hmm. And the, the question of individuals is very interesting because this is where you get the complexity of, of, of the whole process. Mm -hmm. So some individuals would identify and say this is a promising area to invest, uh, mm -hmm. the promising opportunities, mm -hmm. which could be – uh, how we would grow. Uh, but of course, uh, different people see things in different ways and therefore you can have disagreement. So I see an opportunity for growth, but uh, I need your uh, permission to allocate resources to that. And so that becomes the immediate, the seeds on, on, okay, so let's say you agree and we allocate the resources, but then three months later you decide to check and say, let's see how things are going and say, well, wait a minute, this is a five-year process. <laughs> and they say, we can't wait for five years. We want to see results into the short term. So we be begin, you begin to see the tensions very quickly. So this, this um, also introduces time actually because when we think about the feedback loop time is of course this happens it's a process and this happens over time so at at which moment in time do we decide that actually the loop was positive or negative uh, again this is a, <laughs> this is a, a, a great uh, this is a great question um, I mean I, I would I would use a um, an analogy perhaps take a, take a sidetrack but in the in the venture capital community venture capital is also known as, as patient capital and one of the things that they do is they have this mechanism but they can lock thing, lock, cap, lock capital in for 10 to 12 years, mm -hmm. uh, which means that the, the, the investors, the limited partners who provide the funds that are then invested into startups, um, they, of course, they get nervous because what, one of the things you observe is that returns become negative at the beginning. So you have this yeah. the familiar J curve. Returns are negative, and this is where you can get very nervous and you think, I need to take my money Correct, out, yep. but they can't by, by design, so they have to wait for 10 to 12 years. Mm -hmm. And it's only after, you know, in the harvesting period that you can actually see things edging up and they end up, uh, you know, they can end up a lot, of high, a lot higher at the end. Mm -hmm. So how do you have that patience? You know, exactly. is, it, is it three, yes. is it five, is it seven, is it 10 mm -hmm. uh, years? It's, it's a very, very good question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dimo. Mm. But I, I see Natalia. Yes. <laughs> could I just jump in? Because I think Please. a lot of the sort of analogies uh, could be drawn with the family firms because we know a lot of the literature that talks about stocks and flows mm. in family business and how wealth is controlled through long-term orientation and short-term orientation in parallel. So not separately, but together. And so a lot of the investments that are less risky are not kind of built built or used towards growth opportunities but the longer term kind of investments are kind of are assumed to bring better returns mm. and but sometimes you get better returns or short term so i think this is fascinating in terms of in terms of time perspective mm -hmm. but i wanted to go back to the original idea of these loops and who decides mm. because the literature on family firms also indicates quite clearly that if the family member is the CEO, they're more likely to allocate resources for growth endeavor. Mm. So you need to have the presence of the family in order to be the deciding factor in how the resources are allocated, even, even though the resources might, might be scant. And even though as a family firm, you still have risk aversion kind mm. of as, as, as the main kind of conservative strategy. So I think it's it's interesting how looking at younger firms or kind of applying this uh, this particular methodology enables you to to view and maybe kind of to open up a little bit some of the insights in terms of parallel processes that are happening in the firm mm -hmm. and how one becomes productive and less mm. productive. But still, when when you think about family firms. Um, 
you also have to take into account the entrepreneurial dimension. Mm -hmm. And this is also something that you are suggesting, actually, mm -hmm. Dimo, because you combine in your uh, recent mm -hmm. paper entrepreneurial orientation and its three dimensions, proactiveness, innovativeness, mm -hmm. so risk-taking, with what, what's happening in terms of growth or growing as, as, a, as a process. So in a way, you, you suggest that a firm, in order for, for it to grow, it has to stay entrepreneurial or to cultivate entrepreneurship regarding mm -hmm. maybe opportunity identification. Am I, am I mm. right? Yes. Uh, I mean, it was uh, in some of the discussion in the first part when in innovation was, yeah. was shown as a, as a main factor for growth. So I, I see, obviously, innovation and in, in, in entrepreneurship are, in my mind, they're, they're interrelated. Uh, hard to tease out the two, and that's why my title is Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation. So I don't have to I don't have to commit to to one or the other. But innovation <laughs> describes the impact that something has. So it's mm -hmm. novel in the market, mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship has to do with the with the process through which you get to that, and the decisions are more the uh, individual driver, agent, agent of change uh, bit. And you could actually say, you could say that all growth comes from innovative or entrepreneurial activity. And you can also say, uh, but not every innovative or entrepreneurial activity leads to growth. And that's a very, very interesting yeah. asymmetry, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. actually creates some of the patterns you observed at the beginning, that not all firms grow, and it's a very small percentage that do the growth, 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 growth over the, <laughs> over the, fourth, uh, over the fourth period uh, study. And one way to understand that is actually we have a, a process, um, we have an effect that is multiplicative. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, an effect of many things. So there's a there's a saying, it's known as the uh, mm. Anna Karenina principle. Yeah. Right? <laughs> to succeed, everything needs to go right, and, and but to fail, only one needs to go wrong. It's just the, it's the power of multiplication. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that many things have to have to go uh, right, mm -hmm. uh, and it and need to be aligned, mm -hmm. and this actually creates this this skewed a uh, long tail distribution mm -hmm. where the majority of outcomes are actually. Of a, of a relatively small, so this would be stagnant, mm -hmm. stagnant, stagnant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you have a, a long tail, which means that we have cases of growth and they're, mm -hmm. uh, they're not rare. They're, yeah. they're a good number, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a, it's a very distinct uh, yeah. Yeah, case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I, see, I see the time uh, running, of mm -hmm. course, and I, I want to ask you, all of you, a last question uh, for our discussion. What should we do more in not only in family business, but in entrepreneurship research in general, in order to understand growth, but growth with this process and practice perspective? What, what kind of theories, what kind of methodologies we should use more in order to understand growth as a social, not only as an economic phenomenon? Who wants to start? Mm. <laughs> I know, I know, I know that, Dima, you are doing fascinating things, not in relation, mm. necessarily in relation to growth, you know, using pragmatic theory, mm. speech act. We discussed right. about speech act just before the, the show, the role of language. Of course, with Vincent, we saw the role of practices. So mm. I suppose that these might be, you know, potential paths to go and explore more. Well, one one uh, one potential that I could mention is this was actually a motivation for the um, earlier work uh, around complexity. There is a there is a saying in the um, what is known as computational social science, um, and the saying is that if you can't grow something, you haven't you haven't explained its emergence. So the only way to understand something and explain something is to actually grow it. So in a way, to understand growth. You got to grow uh, a firm. So this is a, the, the question that becomes any theory of growth that we have. Can we actually use that theory to suggest to, to can, can that be used to grow to, to actually to inform what we what we do? And this is this that where the pragmatism yeah. comes in and uh, this being future oriented in the sense that can that thing help us in actually help us in what we do? And then this is where it forces us to think about the constructs that we use mm -hmm. in terms of whether these are things that are um, not only operable in, in practice, but are these, are these actually things that are decisions that we make or do they inform the decisions that, mm -hmm. we, that we make? So that's one, one criteria and, and that opens up a whole host of, of, of things that we could be Which raises uh, the issue using. of relevance actually in entrepreneurship mm -hmm. research because what you suggest is that a good theory is a theory that proves actually uh, real, you know, pragmatically speaking in reality and may help actually businesses grow further. Mm -hmm. 
But well, does that such uh, a challenge? <laughs> but does that mean, yeah. Miruna, that uh, potentially because we know a lot about family firms and the fact that they are not growth oriented, mm. should we develop a theory of degrowth of family firms as an alternative? Something that mm. is not about growth; it's about keeping things stable, uh, keeping things working maybe reducing some of the impact. I don't know. This is a kind of, a, it's, it's a thought that came to my mind. I suppose that growth might be one of the, the big taboos or fears of family firms mm. because um, growing uh, may be a risk for their identity. And family firms are so much um, engaged and committed to preserving their identity and their legacy throughout generations that every kind of change especially strategic changes such as succession mm -hmm. you know, and, and growth may, may endanger actually what mm -hmm. has been already accumulated mm -hmm. and achieved over the past. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the resources that Penrose you know, <laughs> was, yeah. was speaking about. So, um, but I know that what you're doing, Vincent, in, in the certificate of, uh, for family business successors, you are actually training our successors to combine these resources in novel ways. And this requires also a little bit of psychological action. <laughs> yeah, we, we try something which is like kind of uh, trying to change a bit the mindset from a successor mindset to more entrepreneurial mindset, mm -hmm. new generation of entrepreneur. I mean, assuming that the family business, keeping a bit of distance with the family business and assuming that it's, this is kind of an asset they're going to start with resource mm -hmm. A resource itself, uh, mm -hmm. by, uh, and they're going to start and, and act and trying to understand what, what 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 could have been the founder mindset at the beginning about the company, and and also it offers the opportunity to assume the the new societal context mm -hmm. and 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 to take it into account in a better way. It's not like continuity. It's more about. Uh, Assuming that this, I will do something new with this resource, keeping, uh, keeping the, the the good components, and and but being able to assume that the context in which I will restart, re, re, it's a rebirth. I, I assume that it's a, the kind of a rebirth situation with the, the family business as uh, an asset or as a resources. I will, I will start with. So it's it's kind of assuming that there are, I, I mentioned that the vocabulary we're using is really important, but it's in the case of, uh, am, am I a new generation of entrepreneur? Am I um, the uh, successor? Am I uh, going to inherit? Uh, mm -hmm. There are several words behind and it depends on the, the situation of the company. Mm -hmm. We're not using the same when it's a dynasty business and we're going oh yeah it's going to be come the heir of the next uh, of the of the company i mean the heir but it's it's going to become the it's the successor of the family business why are we changing those words because we are changing the expectation what they are doing with so it's keeping a bit of distance and assuming kind of an alternative way as mm -hmm entrepreneur of new generation and assuming that we're doing it in another context and with new social relations, with the new societal uh, expectations also. So in a sense, if we, if we apply Penrose to the family firm, this might suggest that it's not only a question of skills, because for Penrose it's a question of skills and knowledge of the managers, their ability to actually combine uh, former resources in novel ways and motivation, of course, to grow. But in family business, this is not enough. These factors are not enough. It's, there, is a, there is a new space, a different space, a different context where we should take into account these expectations, expectations coming from the individual themselves, but also expectations coming from others. And at the same time, also taking into account the, the fact that there, is, there are identity issues involved. If they are self-designing as hair, of course, they won't self-authorize to use and combine these former resources in the same way as if they self-define as entrepreneurs. So this might be also an issue for, for growth in family firms. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dimo and Natalia and Vincent for our discussion. We are certainly just starting to open the black box of growth and there are great opportunities for future inquiries. And we invite you, our audience, to start exploring them more in depth in your own unique cultural, economic and political environment as growth always happens in context, together and for others. Thank you. Hello again.
again and welcome to the last few minutes of our TV show. So we will now present you some publishing opportunities, some conferences tracks that you uh, may like to attend. And I will start with a call for papers in human relations. So in the journal Human Relations, a special issue call for papers on organization creation, theorizing the processes and practices of entrepreneuring at work. And we find Dimo in, in the team together with our colleague Claire Champenois, we say hi to Claire, um, as well as Sylvia Gerardi, Daniel Yort, and Neil Thompson, and the associate editor, Alessia Conto. You know, Dimo, if you, you want to, to do a pitch on this <laughs> special issue and invite yeah, papers, please. Uh, all I can say, it's an exciting space to explore the interconnections between uh, entrepreneurship and organization studies. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, please send your best papers there. Mm -hmm. We also have a set of conferences. Huh? The conference season just, just, is just starting. The first one is the URAM conference on transforming business for good. And there is there a track on family business research as well as, of course, on entrepreneurship. Uh, it will take place in June uh, this year uh, in Dublin, Ireland. So hope to see some of you there. And another conference is FERC, taking place in Florida, also in June this year. And I would invite Nat to tell us a couple of words. Nat Natalia, I know that you are a member of the scientific committee yes. and the organizing team. This yes, year. so uh, I think Don Neobaum is planning a really great event over several days with the doctoral consortium. And I hope that some of you have submitted the papers to this conference. Some of you are going to attend the conference. There's a lot of things going on, uh, lots of supporting sessions for early career researchers and opportunities for networking and discussion and kind of revelations, new revelations <laughs> around family business. So I hope to see those of you that are attending this conference in Del Delray Beach, in Palm oh, Beach, Florida. Wow, sounds exciting. Um, and another conference also coming soon is IFIRA. IFIRA, which will take place in Poland this year. I know that you will be attending uh, this conference in number. And the last one takes place in Valencia, in Spain. Um, and this, this will be in a few weeks from now, so in April. Um, and this is our STEP uh, Global Consortium Conference after several years of uh, break uh, because of COVID. So the 2023 uh, Global Family Business Summit on Regeneration, Managing Change and Innovation in Family Business will take place in April 27-28. I hope to see you there in number. So thank you for your participation to our third STEP conversation series organized by Odensea Business School and broadcasted live from our TV studio in Nantes. I'm grateful and inspired by our conversation today. Please let me also address my warmest thanks to our colleagues in in the backstage, huh? <laughs> Raina Homey, uh, together with Jean-Philippe uh, Picara from Odensea Business School, and Arpita Vias from uh, STEP Consortium. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and hope to see you also in June for our next STEP Conversation series. I wish you a great week. Thank you. <laughs>